Hi there and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about URL analysis. And you might think, well, what's the big deal about URLs? <laughs> what's there to talk about? Now, the idea here is that a lot of the applications nowadays are actually web applications, which are being accessed through URLs. Um, also, from a security perspective, you can look at URLs from two different, uh, let's say, standpoints. First of all, you as the, uh, as the user or as the company owner, if you have a web presence, that is, if you have just a website, well, that website is going to increase your attack surface. And the attack surface is that specific URL, the web address that leads legitimate users as well as attackers to your publicly facing web server. Now, the second idea here is that analyzing URLs is also useful when you're thinking about securing your on-premises network, because the, the users of your local network are going to be connecting to the outside world, to the internet, and they will be accessing remote locations identified by URLs. If you are able to identify those malicious locations, perhaps even before they get a chance to access those locations, uh, you get a much better chance of avoiding potential attacks, potential exploits, or any kind of malware reaching inside of your network. And also, some of the more traditional malware in your network will often try to reach some command and control server through a maybe a static IP address or a, or a static URL, a, a web address. Most likely that's not going to be the case anymore, because in large-scale attacks, uh, this kind of hard-coded behavior is extremely easy to detect, even inside of the malware code or just by looking at the network traffic that is leaving your network. So it can be easily detected and blocked, either by using you know, URL filtering, domain filtering, or by blocking specific IP addresses uh, that the web addresses point to. This kind of filtering makes the malware unusable. So newer malware versions can actually rely on automatically generated URLs to bypass static IP and domain filtering. And one important topic here that you need to remember is called DGAs or domain generation algorithms. Now, what exactly is this? Uh, it's a way of getting around those blacklists, those static blacklists that we talked about. Basically, there are some type of algorithms implemented inside the malware code that are able to generate custom domain names and associate them with IP addresses, register them with dynamic DNS servers so that they can reach their command and control station every single time on a different address. Now, in some aspects, they work very similar to one-time passwords, except that this time we have one-time domain names. And as you can guess, just like OTPs, they are much harder to identify, except for the fact that no such domain generation is, let's say, unlimited, but it's frequently restricted to a range of maybe possible values. Now, let me just show you a quick example here of how such a domain generation algorithm can look like and what the possible results are. And the brief but comprehensive example for this can be found on Wikipedia. If you scroll down here under the domain generation algorithm page, you're going to see a short snippet of code which is going to generate valid domain names depending on the date on which this code is run. So, for example, on January 7th, 2014, this method would generate the domain name, this one right here, while on the following day, it would return something completely different, like this. Right, this was actually used, and this was actually used by, by CryptoLocker. So what exactly happens in a situation like this? Well, first, the malware inside of your network and the code, the command and control code on the attacker's workstation are going to be running the exact same domain generation algorithm. The attacker is going to configure or use a dynamic DNS service. Usually they will be using some uh, more permissive hosting services out there, uh, which are hosting providers that don't exactly look at how you're using their service. Uh, they know you might be doing something bad in there, but since you're the <laughs> paying customer, uh, they can choose to look the other way and take no legal actions against you. 
So the malware in your network is going to implement this DGA algorithm to create a list of domain names. It can either be, uh, let's say, time dependent, perhaps, just like in the example from Wikipedia, or based on some counter. Uh, domains can have random characters in their names, which makes them kind of easier to identify, or they can even rely on dictionary words, which uh, <laughs> makes them look not so suspicious in, uh, in logs and alerts. And the parallel DGA running on the hosting service, the one owned by the attacker, uh, is going to implement exactly the same algorithm. It's going to generate the exact same list of domain names in sync with the rest of the malware that is running in the field. So when the malware needs to communicate with the command and control center, uh, they can use the currently generated list of domains, which is going to match the list on the CNC server, which can now make each communication attempt use a different web address to connect to by continuously changing the domain name and it can even be combined with a continuous change of IP addresses as well if multiple IP addresses perhaps were, were owned or multiple uh, dynamic DNS services were, uh, were contracted by the attacker. This is also sometimes called a fast flux network, a network that frequently changes its IP addressing scheme. And of course, as you can guess, the entire purpose of this is to become extremely difficult to detect and block. Actually, it becomes impossible to detect and block using just static IP or domain uh, blacklists. All right, we're talking about security. So how do we mitigate this? Well, first, we could just hope that the algorithm or the hacker isn't that good. That is, a bad algorithm can be identified by patterns. Uh, sequences, predictable sequences, domain names that cannot be pronounced, <laughs> like those with too many consonants, or any kind of domain that just doesn't look right. Now, I know that many of the startups nowadays have some uh, company names that seem to be impossible to pronounce <laughs> the very first time you see them, uh, but that's a completely different story. Also, uh, domain uh, generation might not be too precise or in sync, synchronized. Uh, so that you will see a lot of non-existent domain errors in your DNS servers from compromised hosts that attempt to connect to non-existent domains uh, on, on the web or domains that haven't just yet been registered as part of the command and control uh, network. Again, this is not foolproof. Non-existent domains are a pretty frequent error that you can see in all DNS logs out there because people just mistype domain names, uh, applications sometimes uh, fail to connect to the right address, or sometimes web services just fail and they return a non-existing domain address. You could also try to rely on blacklisting domains with bad reputation. Some real-time feeds are going to help you with this because if you're relying on non-updated blacklists about domain names, those are going to become obsolete. The <laughs> the next minute, <laughs> okay? So if you're talking about domains that are dynamically generated, you definitely cannot just rely on, a, on a, any kind of static source of information. You need some frequent, constant updates so you can know what to look for, what to block. Otherwise, you could rely on whitelisting all the approved destinations where you know that no malware is residing. Now, good luck with this. It's going to be really difficult. We talked about whitelisting and blacklisting in a previous video. It's going to be pretty difficult, close to impossible, to actually find each and every specific destination that you need to add to that whitelist so that you're not uh, creating any, uh, let's say, uh, disgruntled employees, uh, people that are dissatisfied with how the company internet is behaving, the fact that they cannot use the, their favorite services maybe during work hours, or sometimes it's, it's just difficult just to identify all the possible destinations that your business requires to function. So whitelisting in theory looks like a good approach here. It's definitely not going to include any of those uh, malware domains in there, but it's really difficult to maintain and to create in the first place. Now, some good guys at Cisco thought that they could make your life just a bit easier if you're going for the whitelist approach and they actually developed a free list 
called the Cisco Umbrella 1 million, a free list of the top 1 million most popular website domains. Of course, these are not malicious <laughs> website domains, okay? So we're talking about clean websites. Now you can freely download this one here. It's actually under a, uh, I believe it's a CSV file. So you can just click here and it's going to lead you to another page where you can download it as a CSV file. And I have already done this and it kind of looks like this. I can see it starts with Netflix, <laughs> so it kind of shows the, the number one preference when it comes to people accessing <laughs> websites. Uh, moving forward with uh, some Google websites, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, iCloud, uh, Apple, YouTube, and so on and so forth. Uh, as we said, these are one million rows in one single file here, all of them clean, so you can start with this if you're going for a, for a whitelist approach. Also, if you're looking for some reputation information, there are a number of websites that can help you with this. Uh, just a couple of examples here. Uh, IP Void, for example, let's just say here that I'm not a robot and we want to check something like Netflix.com. Check the domain here. All right, so it's going to show you the status from a number of DNS services and cloud distribution networks all over the world. And pretty much everyone says that Netflix is safe. At least as far as malware is concerned, I wouldn't say it's very safe from a time wasting perspective, but that's a different story altogether. So this is one example for reputation check. Now, you know that I'd also like to give you Cisco examples as well. Professional defect, you could call it. So one such example is, of course, the Talos Intelligence uh, Network, Reputation Network, Engine, whatever you want to call it, it's actually huge. It also has a domain reputation engine as well. Uh, right next to, as you can see here, file reputation, email and spam, and so on, right? So if we just search for Netflix here as well, I'm gonna go through a Cloudflare check. I'm gonna see some information about the website itself, their mail servers, content details, uh, block lists here, added to the block list, no. So we are good to go, right? So this is going to be a trusted website. Now you can probably also see here on the right, right hand side that the web reputation right now is trusted, right? The new one is trusted, the legacy one was good. Don't know why. <laughs> But anyway, it's going to be a safe uh, website. So you can also access this information through an API, by the way. And just let me give you one last example here. This one is from GitHub. It's just a small list, a TXD list, uh, just to show you the kind of DNS names generated by domain generation algorithm. As you can see here, uh, the repository is publicly available. Uh, it might not be here forever, but just have a look here and try to figure out if you could identify these URLs inside of an IPS log, a web proxy log, a DNS log, how would you detect domain names like these, right? Just by eyeballing them, it kind of looks easy. But if you're trying to write a script to identify these automatically, it might prove just a bit challenging. Now let's talk a bit about URL analysis and a URL can actually have multiple components, not just the domain or the resource uh, that you're being addressed, but they can also encode information and can submit that information from the client to the web server. And that information can potentially be malicious. So the components inside of a URL are going to be the domain, the resource path, which might be a file or might look like, uh, like a directory. We're going to see an example in just a few seconds. And anything that comes after the question mark, is going to be about sending information to the resource itself, All right? So if you take an example, kind of like this one here, it's a made up example here, we're gonna see that it starts with the domain name, the part that starts with the protocol followed by the domain itself. Now the protocol itself is not part of the domain, of course, but it also indicates what kind of connection to initiate to the web server itself. So is it gonna be an HTTP connection by default on port 80 or an HTTPS by default on port 443? This is what tells the browser how to initiate that connection. So the first part is the domain. The second one is gonna be the query. That's the resource that we're actually addressing. In our case here, it's going to be a file followed by a content query. So we're basically sending through that content parameter in there, some information to the web server. 
And that's going to be the information that we're sending. And what you're seeing here is actually called percent encoding. First of all, because you can see a lot of percent signs in there, right? <laughs> we're going to talk about this in just, a, in just a couple of seconds, but it's a way to encode information, text or even binary information to be sent along with the URL itself. And finally, we do have some additional content here at the very end, which can be an obfuscated domain or even a malicious script that is embedded in the URL itself. Now, just for your general knowledge, of course, there are some additional components here that can be found inside of a URL. You probably, uh, you've probably seen anchors. That's the hashtag sign, the hash bound sign, whatever it's called, <laughs> which points to a specific location within an HTML document or a section in a page, but it can also be abused to inject some JavaScript code. And speaking about the methods that we can use to analyze this kind of code, normally we're going to start by doing what is called a sandbox analysis. That is, we're not going to touch that URL, we're not going to access it, but we're just going to analyze it without, without executing it, without, without trying to reach the resource behind that, uh, that URL. So first, we need to resolve that percent encoding. Right. We need to figure out what is actually encoded within that URL. Is it a file? Is it a script? Is it any kind of binary data, perhaps, that should not be present in there? Then we're going to be checking for redirects. Is the URL actually an instruction for the client? If you manage to trick some, some user into clicking into it, is it going to actually redirect that user to another website or not? Then we're going to be looking at assembling any scripts that might be encoding using percent encoding inside of that URL and figure out if those scripts have any business being there. And if they do, whether they contain some malicious code or not. Of course, we're going to be looking at reputation checks, just like we saw before. We're going to look for that domain inside of some uh, well-known reputation lists just to see if Historically, has there been any kind of malware originated from that domain name? Has it been a source of spam? Has anybody reported it as being malicious or not? We can also look at the DNS time to live for that domain. Now, why is this relevant? I don't know about you, but I have encountered, often encountered situations where while I was connected to a corporate big company network, I wasn't allowed to access my home network because my home network uses a dynamic DNS service to continuously update the IP address that I'm using on my home router. My, my IP address at home changes from time to time, so I need a dynamic DNS service so that I always have a, a single name that I can use to reach, uh, reach my home network. Now, while this is extremely convenient from an administrative perspective, unfortunately, dynamic DNS servers are sometimes not that well regarded from a security perspective. Because when I'm connected to a corporate network with all the firewalls and traffic inspection engines going out and look at them at my traffic, uh, when I try to access my home network using my home domain name, it's going to look at the domain name. It's going to see, oh, well, this domain has a very short time to live. And that time to live is actually the time that the DNS server actually instructs any resolvers to hold that information in their cache memory before requesting it again. And since we're talking about DN dynamic DNS servers, well, that time to live is going to be pretty small or smaller than, let's say, regular websites, because we expect to change, to be able to change that information and that information to change quite frequently. Now, your, IP, your home IP address might change every few hours or every few days. So we're going to have a much lower time to live for those dynamic DNS entries. Now, if you're looking at from a security perspective, you know, when I was connected to the to the corporate network, uh, the uh, the inspection engines there were looking at, oh, so this guy wants to access some web destination with a very small time to live. So definitely that destination is not a reputable site. That is, it's not a well-known location because if it were something like Netflix or CNN or Microsoft, well, those websites are pretty stable. They have much higher values for that time to live. A parameter. Now, a small time to live means that the website might be fluctuating or the, the IP address might change frequently, which is not good news when it comes to web reputation. So looking at the DNS time to live can also provide you an indicator, potential indicator. It's not going to be 100% foolproof that the destination might not be something that you want to let your users access. And remember, all this type of analysis happens, that's why we call it sandbox, before we even access the URL itself.
Now, when talking about URLs and web locations, remember that the number one protocol that we're going to be using is HTTP. So a brief understanding of HTTP is also useful. So in short, a client, which in our case is most likely going to be a browser, also called sometimes a user agent, uh, makes an HTTP request to a web server listening on a TCP port. Now, by default, those ports are going to be port 80 for plain text HTTP and 443 for HTTPS. That's HTTP over TLS encrypted using a TLS connection. Now, in real life, these ports can be any number. This is just a convention so that you don't have to specify the port every single time you access a website, but there's nothing uh, holding you back from running a web server on port 1234. And HTTP is a request-based protocol, and typically a request is going to include an HTTP method, a resource that's going to be identified by the URL, and some headers, and of course the body of the request itself. Among the most common methods that you're going to encounter, uh, we're going to see methods such as get, which is used to request a specific resource. Put is another method which is used to create or replace a resource. Be very careful with this one because this creates an additional attack vector. This is basically allowing outside clients to send data to your web server. That's an attack vector. It's really bad. Make sure you secure it if you really need it in your application. A post, this one is going to be about sending data for processing. Again, a potential malware vector. Head is going to request just the header of the response. And delete, which you can probably guess what this does with uh, web resources. Now, of course, not all these methods are supported on all the web servers and all the web applications, not because of uh, any lack of features, but because most applications don't need all of them, or you just don't want to let your users you know, create information or delete information from your from your web server. Uh, careful that uh, get, put, and uh, post methods, they can all submit data. So when it comes to validating input from your users or customers or whoever is using your, your website, uh, make sure you sanitize everything that comes into these three potential methods. Now, of course, we talked about the request, but the request is being sent from the client to the server so that the server can reply back with some content. Normally, this content is going to look in your browser as a website or as a file that gets downloaded to your computer. But behind that response, there's actually a response code. So the server is first going to identify its response by using some predefined codes. And these codes belong to some well-known categories. Now, the category is determined by the first digit here. The code itself is three digits long. So the first category would be response codes that start with uh, the number two. So 200 something means that the operation was successful. So for example, we're going to get a 200 for a successful get or successful post or a 201 for a successful put if the operation is allowed, of course. Another uh, another category here is the 300 uh, responses, which are basically about redirects. This is going to be a way of the web server of telling you, telling your browser to go look somewhere else. So if the web page has moved, if you're supposed to be redirected to another location, that kind of information is going to come back to your browser under a 300 type of response code. Uh, 400 codes means that uh, it's your fault. <laughs> so, uh, your request is bad. <laughs> so that's basically what the what the web server is, is saying. The 400 category uh, includes errors, but these are considered to be client side errors. Uh, you probably you've probably seen errors such as 404. That's going to be non-existing resource. Interesting thing to notice here. If the resource doesn't exist, the web server thinks that it's your fault for requesting something that doesn't exist. <laughs> so a resource, so a code of uh, 404 resource not found, uh, it's going to be your fault. <laughs> Another uh, example here would be 403 for insufficient permissions. Maybe the web server or your current session doesn't have enough uh, permissions to access the resource that you're trying to trying to get. Or even 401, if the uh, if the website, the web application requires authentication, you fail that authentication when trying to access a specific resource. This is one of the error codes that you might be getting. Another one here, the category of 500 errors 
it's uh, the server type errors. Now this is the uh, this is the place where the server basically admits that okay, it's it's my <laughs> issue here, it's my problem for not being able to serve you with this uh, with this resource. It might be because uh, there's a resource exhaustion on the web server, not not enough resources uh, to uh, to return the resource or to process the request or just a general server failure. Things just don't work on the server side. Those are going to be indicated by the 500 codes. Now for the exam, you don't really have to know all of these codes. There are actually tens, if not hundreds uh, in total. Uh, you can look them up on Wikipedia, on any number of websites. For the exam, you should just know the main categories here. Now we mentioned that part of URL analysis and a very important step in URL analysis is decoding the URL itself. And that's because URLs can use something known as percent encoding. We mentioned this briefly before. Let's see exactly uh, how it works and what can we do with it. Uh, percent encoding is useful because it gives the ability to a uh, user agent, to your browser, to any kind of client that you're using to interact with the web server, it gives you the ability to submit even binary data as part of the URL itself. When I say binary data, that's not text data. That's basically things like executable files, multimedia files, images, anything that can be encoded as a binary file can actually be encoded with printable characters using percent encoding within the URL itself. Generally, data can be submitted to a web server by using uh, post uh, or put methods, and of course the uh, corresponding HTTP headers and the body, or by encoding that data within the URL itself to access the resource. And this is where you're using, uh, you're using uh, URL encoding. Now, among the alternative uh, use cases for URL encoding, uh, we can also find things like uh, using URL encoding to obfuscate parts of the URL. If you don't want a, uh, let's say, less educated user to figure out quickly what that link does, where it's going to send him or her, then you can use URL encoding here and they're going to see some just gibberish in there. They're not going to realize how the exact resource that they're accessing uh, looks like and where it is located. Uh, we can also use it to embed scripts. So we can uh, embed JavaScript, so you can embed any kind of scripts here, of course, malicious ones if you're an, uh, you're an attacker. And of course, these are not going to be visible for the for the user that clicks on the link they're just going to see some gibberish some random characters in there as far as they're concerned or we can even go one step further and use percent encoding to attempt to exploit vulnerabilities in the way the web server tries to decode <laughs> that that percent encoding so there might be vulnerabilities or exploits out there that take into consideration the fact that some web servers don't actually manage memory properly when trying to decode those URLs. So we could potentially craft a, a buffer overflow exploit within the URL itself. And if that's not enough, remember that percent encoding can also be done in multiple iterations one after the other uh, by further encoding even the percent characters to further obfuscate the contents. Now do that like a hundred times. Just re-encode the URL a hundred times over and over and over. Now you're going to end up with a huge URL indeed, but that there's little chance that any automated tool is going to be able to decode what's behind that URL before accessing it. So the bottom line here is that you should remember that URLs can also include malicious code, can embed malicious code by using this type of URL encoding. So generally URLs can contain uh, these valid characters here. Uh, we also have some reserved characters that are going to be used as delimiters and there are also uh, so-called unsafe characters. There are going to be the white spaces, the delimiters for scripts, used for scripts and or uh, SQL injection, for example, which should not be found, should not occur within a URL. So that's some, at least the minimum level of input validation that you should be performing on your URLs before you're allowing your users to resolve them and then access their corresponding web resource. Couple of examples here, 
Just a couple of examples here. Of course, good old Wikipedia here can show us how in percent encoding actually works. And it can also give you a couple of examples here of equivalent percent encoding for any special characters that might be found within the URL. In this case, these are going to be the reserved uh, characters. And by the way, if you want to play with URL encoding and decoding, there's just a huge amount of uh, websites, web applications out there that can do this for you online. This is the the one that you see here on the screen on the slide. It's uh, it's just the first result that I got just by searching on Google uh, URL encode online. So play with it. Make sure you understand what's going on in there. Try to decode some of the uh, URLs that you can find in public websites because URL encoding is not just used for malicious purposes, but it's actually uh, very widespread. Uh, look for uh, well-known news websites or links shared from social media, any type of URL that encodes a lot of information, meta information apart from the actual content is most likely going to be using URL encoding. Recognize and understand generally what happens with percent encoding and why is it dangerous, right? Thank you so much for watching. See you next time when we're going to talk about port security and network access control. And in the meantime, if you found this useful, give me a like, subscribe to this channel and see you next time.